going to talk more about that in due time, all right? And so I think we should just read the Bible. How does that sound, everyone? <laughs> okay, let's go. Uh, Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 28, we read, One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked him, of all the commandments, which is the most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Well said, teacher, said the man. You are right in saying that God is one and there is no other but him. To love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all your strength and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. Jesus, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Jesus, we just acknowledge your presence in this space. We acknowledge that you are nearer to us than our, even our breath. So God, we just say thank you. Thank you that you would love us that much, that you would draw near to us. Jesus, would you be with us as we examine your word? Would it encourage and edify us where we need encouragement and edification? Jesus, we bless you. We pray this all in your mighty name, Lord. Amen. Yo, we know a lot of things, don't we? We know a lot of things. You know a lot of things. I know a lot of things. I know that to get shredded, I need to hit the gym in a certain way and eat certain foods. You know, <laughs> we know that, generally speaking, that debt is bad. Yet, most of us, we still got it. We know that fast food is a fast track to health issues. Yeah, we still pull up. We, we, uh, too, we know all too much that screen time, too much screen time, too much social media is bad for us. Yet we still scroll. We know a lot, don't we? But it's not enough to know. It's not enough to know. What does this tell us? It tells us that we can know all types of things. You and I have all sorts of knowledge from the internet, from school, from life. But without action, what's the point? What's the point about knowing about healthy things, healthy lifestyles, if you don't live it? What's the point of knowing all the stuff about screens that we know in social media and its effects on our mental health if we don't set limits? What's the point? In today's passage, we read about a scribe coming to Jesus to ask him a question. Let me paint the picture of the context for you. If you remember to last Sunday, we talked about how Jesus, he went to the temple and he rebuked the Sanhedrin, which was the leadership of the temple made up of the high priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. He rebuked them for their corrupt and poor leadership. They were, they were making their means, they were getting rich off the uh, tithes and off the offerings of the poor, and they were sectioning off the temple to where only the Israelite men could actually come and partake in the deepest sense of worship within the temple. And he was rebuking them, saying, you're like that fig tree over there, full of life, teeming with leaves, yet no fruit. You're like that fig tree that I just cursed and a day later withered away because you've got no fruit. You all show. After that, the Sanhedrin began to say, hey, we need to get rid of this guy. We need to get rid of this guy because he is going to be a thorn in our foot. But we can't just get rid of him or else the crowds might overtake us. 
Jesus, he continued to go to the temple. He continued to teach on the kingdom of God. He continued to point the whole poke holes in the religious elite and how they were operating things. And finally, the Sanhedrin said, hey, listen, we've got to do something, but it can't be a physical thing. We've got to catch him, incriminate him with his words. And so the Sanhedrin first sent out the Pharisees. And the Pharisees came to Jesus and the Herodians came to Jesus, but Jesus had left them amazed. They couldn't get him. Then they sent the Sadducees, and the Sadducees were left speechless. And then he, they sent a scribe. The third wave of, of the Sanhedrin's headhunters comes out in the form of one scribe. And the scribe, he asks a question. What is the greatest commandment? Or better yet, what is the fundamental commandment that, that holds all the other commandments what is it, Jesus? You see, the scribe was incredibly wise and knowledgeable because most of them were. Scribes concerned themselves with the proper exposition of the law or the Old Testament, primarily the first five books, and had gained a reputation for the great understanding and ability to interpret the text. They were smart, some of the smartest dudes around, known for their reading and writing and their ability to think deeply on the Torah. They knew all 600 plus laws. They knew which ones were great laws and which ones weren't so great laws, which ones demanded a certain level of observation and others not so much. They knew how to finagle their way through the laws and remain on top. And so this incredibly learned man comes to Jesus and says, which one is it, Jesus? Which one is it? Jesus' response was the greatest commandments, love God and love others. To which the scribe responds, you're right. Those are the greatest. And in fact, they're better than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices we could offer. It's interesting that the scribe agrees to that. That's the very thing that days prior Jesus stopped within the temple because they were taking advantage of the burnt offerings and sacrifices. He agrees, you're right. And what does Jesus say in response? You are not far off from the kingdom of God. You, smart man, are not far off from the kingdom of God, but you're not there yet but you're not there yet. In other words, it's not enough to know. It is not enough to know. His theology couldn't get him there. His knowledge couldn't get him there. His wisdom couldn't get them there. His intellect could not get him there. You know, it's easy to fall into that same mindset. If I just know enough theology... If I know enough doctrine, if I know enough uh, about scripture, if I, if, I, if I am smart enough, I can get there. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus says, no, you can't. No, you can't. It's not enough to know. So how do we cross that line? How would the scribe have crossed that line from being close to being in. How? Well, that's what Jesus begins to teach about or taught about leading up to that interaction. And in starting in verse 28, we begin to see that the first step of crossing that line is love for God. We need to love God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. I love this. Jesus, he answers the scribe's question by putting two scriptures together. The first is seen here. And this was famous. The scribe would have memorized this. He would have known everything about this because it's the beginning of what was called the Shema. 
The Shema was, is a daily prayer that Jews read, devout Jews read. They, they, they profess every morning the Shema. It orients them in their day. And Jesus answers by pulling from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 through 6, where the Shema, at least the first, the first paragraph of the Shema, is found. Now, it's important to set the tone. Uh, it's important that Jesus would have used this text because it set the tone for the rest of the passage. First, we need to know that Shema means here. Shema means here. But there's a distinction it doesn't mean listen. It doesn't mean listen. It means hear. Uh, an example, my son, when I tell him to put something away and he does it, he shamas me. He shamas me. You hear me? When I say, hey, son, put that away and he does it, he's listening. But he's not hearing. Hearing, shema, necessitates action. It necessitates movement. It's one thing to listen to God. It's another thing to hear God. So first, Shema, hear. He sets the tone. He sets the tone for the greatest commandment. We've got to hear God. And the second, he uses uh, love, love. Or in Hebrew, ahava, ahava, love. This type of love is deeper than positive emotions towards something. It, it, it necessitates, again, actions. A good example is the Israelites, in their ahava of God, they would walk in faithfulness in light of the covenant that they had made with God back between God and Abraham. I will make a covenant with you. I will bless you, and I will use you to bless the nations. We see this theme, this thread of covenants throughout the text, throughout the story of God and his people. And for God's people to ahava God, they had to follow. They had to be faithful as they hear, as they heard God. Just like a married couple lives in light of their covenant. They're faithful to one another in light of their covenant, so the people of God are faithful to God in light of the covenant. And so the question is, how do we then love God? How do we ahava God? How do we hear God? Well, Jesus, he answers that. As he says, you must love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. You've got to love them with your heart. The heart is the center point of decision-making and affection. It's not the literal heart beating in your chest right now, but it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor for your affection, and it's your control center. And so we have to love God with our whole heart. I love what Martin Luther, the reformer, writes. He says, whatever your heart clings to and confides in, that is really your God. So you have to love him with all of your affection, with all of your decision-making. The basis of your decision-making and desire has to be predicated on your love to God, your faithfulness to God. Nothing can assume that top spot. Nothing can assume that top spot. You know what they call that in the business? Idol. It's an idol. The business was church. We all got, we're on the same, okay, cool. We call that an idol. Jesus has to occupy, God has to occupy that top spot. Second, your soul or your desire and your feelings. Your chief desire has to be God. Your chief desire, past your desire to make it, make it big, past your desire to look a certain way, past your desire to feel a certain way, it has to be God. Love the Lord your God with all of your soul. And between the heart and between the soul, you have the motivating factor in each one of our lives. Where the heart and the soul meet, where they intersect, that is the main, that is the main momentum, motivation 
for you and I in our daily lives. And so Jesus hits that part, but he continues on. He says, with your mind, with your intellect, you have to love God. What I love about this is in the Shema or in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 6, it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, and strength. It does not mention mind. But I feel like Jesus does this for two reasons. The first is because he knows the man sitting before him is all about the mind. He's a scribe. He's known for his mind. He's known for his wisdom. He's known for his intellect. And so Jesus points a finger right at that. And in, in, in a way, he also puts it on the priority list. He says, you got to love God with your heart and your soul, then your mind. You see, I think what this scribe had gotten into, his, his problem was he was loving God or attempting to love God with solely his mind, but not his heart and his soul. And the second is to bring a totality to the message He says, every part of you, every part of you must love God, ahava, God. And finally, strength, our body and our resources. These are the things that encapsulate our love for God. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, that feels a little bit like everything. That's the point. I think sometimes we read this text and we're like, okay, how are we going to love God with this part? with our mind? How do we love him with our soul? And I could sit up here and I could tell you ways to to habitually love God, to express your love for God in each one of these categories. But the important part, the part that we need to internalize is that God wants all of us. You can't tithe on your love. You can't just give God 10%. He wants all of it because he gives all of himself to us. He gave all of himself for us. We can't tithe on our love. He wants the whole thing. It it would be like for Kate and I, my wife, front row here is looking so amazing, babe. Um, (laughs) She's pregnant, beaming in glory. Um, And uh, it would be like, hey, listen, babe, I love you. But uh, I think about other women all the time babe, I love you, but I'm not home very often. Babe, I love you. I don't contribute to her or the family. Babe, I love you. Do I? That's not love. That's a scrub. (laughs) That's not someone who loves somebody. That's someone who says they love somebody but doesn't live it out. And so the same is true with us and God. Do you love God? Do you love God? Are you giving him 10% or are you giving him everything? Everything. That's the question and that's the burden that's placed on us as we read this text. And that's the burden that the scribe was feeling as he heard these words. God, he wants everything. And it doesn't end there. Oh, I want to read you this quote. This is good. Uh, James K.A. Smith writes, We learn to love then, not primarily by acquiring information about what we should love, but rather through practices that form the habits of how we love. You get the distinction there? I'm sure a lot of you know a lot about Jesus. I believe it. I've talked with a lot of you. You know a lot about Jesus, but do you love Jesus? Do you love him? Do you live out that love? Do you express that love? Or is it your bumper sticker? (laughs) And your Instagram bio, God first. What is it? I'm inviting, I, listen, this text, this does it forever. Me too. I'm sitting here after a week of wrestling with this. <laughs> you know? It's hard looking in the mirror and asking ourselves, do we love God? And if we love God, then there's a proof attached to it. Are you ready? Seatbelts on? Love others. Love others. 
The second is this, says Jesus, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So on the one end, with love God, Jesus brings in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And on this end, on this front, he brings in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, that reads, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. These, these commandments are the greatest commandment. Upon these sit all the other commandments. Upon these sit all of our orthopraxy, all of our devotion, love God and love others. For the Israelites, especially within this context, the neighbor that's referred to here would be just other Jews. Those were the neighbors. But everyone outside of of the Israelite uh, nation, they're not our neighbors. So Jesus begins to derail this when he's asked by another scribe, who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Do you guys remember this? He responds with a parable. The parable, you may have heard of it, the good Samaritan. A Samaritan to a Jew was was unclean. I want nothing to do with a Samaritan. They were more than ethnically other. They were a mixed breed with the Israelites and the Assyrians. Like, listen, that, that's the worst of the worst. Yet Jesus uses a Samaritan as the hero of the story. And when asked, who is my neighbor? Jesus says, that one. Not the rabbi, not the Levi, not the priest. That one, the Samaritan, is your neighbor. So Jesus expands their vision of who a neighbor is. Love your neighbor, not just your fellow Jew, but everybody. Love everybody. Express your love. And how much so? Love them as you love yourself. We love ourselves a lot, don't we? Spend a lot of time in that mirror, making sure our eyebrows are looking good. In the same way, the unibrow comes in fierce. You got to pluck it. We love ourselves, right? We want to eat good. We love ourselves, right? We want to make money and dress nice. We love ourselves. Jesus says, love your neighbor like that. Love your neighbor like that. Know your neighbor like you know yourself. You know the eyebrow thing? Like you know when it needs a good plucking? Know your neighbor. Listen to your neighbor's pain. Listen to your neighbor's story and love them like you love yourself. Jesus, he links the two because if we don't link the two, there's serious implications. If we just love God without loving neighbor, what we're doing is we're doing and thinking for God, but we're not loving him. Love for God always leads to love for others. This is manifest in churches and communities that sacrifice love and concern for others on the altar of theology and intellectualism. It's not a worship of Jesus. It's not worshiping God. That's worshiping ourselves, our minds. And so we can't just love God and not love neighbor. And surely we can't just love neighbor and not love God because that's not loving Jesus. And then what are we talking about? Love for God, uh, love for neighbor is built upon, is predicated upon our love for God. This is manifested in churches that sacrifice the truth and love of God at the altar of culture and palpability. This is what culture is doing, so we're just going to do it like that because we're going to love our neighbor. We're going to sacrifice the truth of God because it's easier. It's more palatable. It's more palatable to the world around us. That's the way to do it, right? 10, 15 months Maybe last years later, it's like, what are we doing here? What is this built upon? So the church has to be united and equally concerned with God, the love of God and the love of others. I think one of the best examples that we have of this in the American church is the black church. Generally speaking, the black church has always held those two loves together well. It hasn't just been, I'm gonna write a check and call it good. 
but there's a concern, a deep concern for society and reforming it in a way that brings about the flourishing of fellow image bearers. Meanwhile, staking themselves, grounding themselves upon the word of God under the authority of him and his word. They've historically done it well on the uh, homiletical tradition, the preaching tradition of the black church. uh, Dr. Lewis Baldwin writes and calls it that tradition which refuses to separate religious faith and moral considerations from politics, legal matters, and social reformism. Essentially, hey, the kingdom of God touches everything. God wants our everything. Within the kingdom of God, his rule and reign, God's rule and reign, it touches everything. So we're going to live as if that's true. Can we just live as if that's true? We're going we're gonna to preach on everything. I think we can learn a lot from the black church. I really do. And I think the black church, at least for me personally, gives us a lot of hope, gives me a lot of hope for who we could be, that we could actually bridge the two well. And can you imagine what that would look like here? Could you imagine if we were known for loving God with our whole selves and loving others as we love ourselves? Can you imagine how that would impact you as an individual? If you were in a community of people who were doing the same thing, loving you, serving you. I'm not going to name names here, but one of our anchor groups came around a couple that were struggling uh, with a, uh, a mechanical issue on their vehicle. And so they raised 670 some odd dollars just to bless them and to make sure that their vehicle was covered and would work properly. This is loving your neighbor. This, can you imagine more stories of this? Could you imagine more rumors of a church in the Lincoln District? Yeah, in, in tucked away in the Lincoln District, right off South 45th. Can you imagine the rumors that would begin to break out? There's a community that actually sacrificially loves one another. Could you imagine what that would do for us? Could you imagine what that would do for the community around us? Yo, this is what the kingdom of God looks like. Can you imagine the witness? I believe it's possible. I do. But the question then is how? Okay, I just love God. Now what? How do I do that? How do I love God? You know, uh, McCoy and Mooney uh, are sons. Uh, Their birthday is three days apart. And so that means everything's going to be done together. <laughs> like, like you're going to be 17 years old, and it's like, yeah, you get the same bike because we ain't getting you a car. Like, come on, pull your weight. You're a year past 16. Get a job. <laughs> no, but that means we're, we're, we're sharing the birthday party. We're sharing the birthday present. And for them, we're built, we built a deck, and we're going to put a little house on it so they can play on a deck with a house on it. It's going to be beautiful. And uh, to do that, uh, we, I spent the past two days building a deck, hence why I'm sitting, because my body just ain't meant for it. God said, I'm going to make you a preacher, <laughs> not a carpenter. <laughs> Tiger bomb on everything. And, uh, and so for the deck, uh, the focus, you have to focus on two things when you're building a deck, the foundation and the frame. If you get the foundation off, it's not going to last. It's not going to sustain the actual deck. It's going to melt away. If you get the frame wrong, it's going to be wonky. And it's not even really going to be a deck. And so you have to get the foundation and the frame right. The same is true as we have this conversation. How do we love God? How do we love neighbors? How do we love others? We focus first on the foundation. The foundation of our love and devotion to God is his love towards us. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's the same way that Jesus loved us. Jesus loved us with his whole being. Jesus, who stepped into the flesh, he created and sustains. 
sacrificed himself for you and I to make a way for you and I to make atonement for our sins and to have a right relationship with God again. God gave him whole, his whole self. He didn't just sin 10% of himself. Here's my, here's my legs. Go on now, legs, and do the work. 100%. Fully God, fully man, for the sake of you and I, for the sake of humanity, because he so loved you. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever should believe in him would not perish, but receive eternal life. Jesus, he gave his 100%. And that is the 100% that we are founded on. None of this matters if we don't get the love of God right. If we don't understand that God loves us, then it's just rote religiosity. Just trying to feel better about ourselves. If we don't get the love of God right, it's just used as a, as a, a, a means of, of thumping people on the head that are different from us. If we don't get the love of God right, we don't get any of it right. And so we have to ground ourselves on the foundation, the firm foundation that is Christ and his work and his love for you, for you. And from that foundation, we can begin to build a frame. Now, what is that frame? That frame is the full love for God and others. That frame is us giving ourselves to the Lord, every part of us, in giving ourself to others. It's the expressed love of God. Expressed. Key word is expressed. Just like I can't tell Kate I love her and not actually express love, so we can't tell God we love him without expressing it. I can't tell you, hey, I love you without expressing it to you without at least listening, praying for, spending time with you. I can't tell you I love you if I don't express it. So we express our love for God on the grounds of his expressed love towards us. We can't get it twisted. We model our lives after Jesus and the life he lived on earth. We give God our decision-making, our motivations, our desires, our minds, our attention, our identity, and our relationships. The question that we have on repeat is, am I founded on the firm foundation in this area of my life? And we adjust accordingly. I love how Eugene Peterson says, Eugene Peterson says that faith is a long road in the same direction. It's a long obedience in the same direction. It's it's orienting ourselves north. It's orienting ourselves towards Jesus and walking that way day by day, sometimes crawling, other times sprinting towards Jesus, loving him more and more, adjusting accordingly. Well, man, I'm drinking a little too much. Adjust accordingly. Man, I am not generous with any part of me. Adjust accordingly. I think I'm believing something that Jesus doesn't believe. Adjust accordingly. Adjust accordingly within the bounds of God's grace. Knowing that when we confess our sins and our shortcomings, he is faithful and just to restore us, to renew us, to make us new. And so we love him. That's the firm, that is the frame that we build on top of that firm foundation. I want to end with uh, the reality that we can only love God because he first loved us. We can only give our whole selves to God because he gave his whole self to us. We can only live self-sacrificially because Jesus sacrificed himself for us. When we grasp this, it changes everything. When we're able to grasp that Jesus loves us so much and that love is what animates our love for him and love for others. Jesus' response to us is no longer, you're not far from the kingdom of God, but it's welcome in. It's welcome in, amen? Jesus, we bless you. We love you. 
Jesus, we thank you that you sacrificed yourself for us on a cross to make a way for us to receive life and life abundantly. Lord, we thank you that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. That the reality that we ought to love you with everything we have is not one that we bear on our own strength. But because of your great love for us, Jesus, we have the strength to love you. And we have the grace to mess up. We have your mercy to fall short because you build us up as we go along this long road. And so, Lord, we bless you. We thank you that you are our Savior. We thank you that you are our healer, that you sanctify us, and that you're coming back to renew everything. Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. So now's the time that we take for communion. For those of us who consider themselves a father, you'll come to